Um, so Harim and I are going to kind of tag team and take you through uh, the project scoping worksheet, which is something that was developed by the Center for Data Science and Public Policy. Um, that's really uh, to help projects, to help scope projects that are for social good in the data science realm. Um, so that's not going to, uh, this isn't going to be something that every single solve project will necessarily need to fill out start to finish. Um, but we think that this will be a helpful resource for anyone who's scoping a data science for good project in general, and that any scope project, all the, or, sorry, solve project um, will include um, some part of this um, and that it's going to be valuable for anyone who's scoping a project for solve to have considered all of these attributes. Um, so I will start sharing my screen and I'll also share the link to this, this worksheet so you can follow along at home. Yeah, I think one thing we do have to resolve is what do we call members of the community? Are they solvers? You know, because <laughs> that's just something I think we'd like people to weigh in on too as we go through this. Good question. <laughs> just important, as... urgent question. <laughs> uh, okay, everybody can see my screen all right? Yeah. All right, great. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of break this up into chunks uh, as we go through. Um, first, we'll talk about the project um, problem description, the goals of the project, the actions that will be taken, some of the things that Rob just touched on. Uh, then we'll talk about the actual data requirements. Um, then we'll talk about the analysis, the technical components, um, and the evaluation methods uh, and implementation. And then finally, we'll talk about ethics, um, which that includes privacy, transparency, checking for bias, all of those good things. So we'll go through kind of section by section um, and just give kind of some of the most important things to keep in mind um, and some salient examples from our experience. Um, and at the end of each of those sections, we'll pause and take any questions. So if you have questions as we go, please throw them in the chat, the Q&A, um, and then we'll answer as we go. Does that sound good to everyone? Cool. All right, so I think, I mean, I think Rob kind of teed this up for us pretty well um, about having, you know, having an action that you're going to take as the result of um, a data science project. I think two of the most common mistakes um, or problems that we will see with uh, projects that are submitted for DSSG are um, starting with something like, it would be interesting to know if X, Y, or Z um, or starting with, we want to do something with big data and machine learning, um, which the problem statement should come before either of those two things, right? So um, it's not that you can't do something that's, that's just finding, you know, finding out things that are interesting to know and that you can't explore those avenues, um, but it should be in service of whatever your larger goal is um, as a team and an organization. Uh, so having some idea even if um, you know say a project that you would submit for solve is about exploratory data analysis at least kind of you know what it, what are you trying to figure out through that data analysis um, and what is that going to inform so it doesn't need to necessarily be that at the end of the day it's going to change everything that you do but um, just you know what why do you want to know that um, and what might you ultimately do differently as a result of knowing that um, and another thing to keep in mind here is, is how are you currently approaching this problem that you're trying to solve? Um, so why is it, is there a reason to believe that um, data will actually help you with that? Um, and wh why is there that reason to believe? So I think one, one example of a, a time where this kind of hasn't always gone right um, is there have been a couple of projects either submitted or um, projects that have been in the fellowship that are kind of recommender systems. So for example, matching a uh, patient to a doctor and making the best match there. Um, and so a challenge that we've seen in those cases is that um, it's not always clear what, 
you know, that you would have an improvement in outcomes um, if you matched a patient to a different doctor. Um, and it's not always clear how you would define what is a good match um, and how you could kind of justify what that, that a better match could be made with data. Um, and it's okay, I think just as a qualifier for that, it's okay if you don't necessarily have, you know, you might not have quantitative evidence of these kind of counterfactuals of what would have happened if a patient were matched with a different doctor um, to be able to measure how different the outcomes are for patients. But um, having even some kind of domain knowledge about what, what makes a good match and what things are improved and then being able to measure that makes the project likely to be more successful. Um, so on, this, on the worksheet here, you know, there are these, these questions like, what is the problem you're facing? Who and what is affected by this problem, right? Um, if it's gonna be for social good, there should be some, some effect on um, some people or, or places. Um, and then kind of some, some idea of why it's a priority and how many people are affected by this or how, what, what is the scope of it, right? So kind of how big a problem is this? How pressing is it? Um, and how important is it to you as an, an organization? And I think just to jump in here, right? The, the, those questions are really getting at the organization you're gonna work with or you're part of to really prioritize. If this is not an important problem to you, if you haven't, if it's gonna affect three people and you're gonna spend, you know, those resources could be spent on, on, a, on a problem that has a higher impact. So this is really making sure that the work for the volunteers on this, on, on this webinar, right? The work you're doing in order for it to have impact, that organization has to have thought through these things and be ready to prioritize it. Otherwise, your work is wasted. Uh, and for the organization, same thing. If you're going to go build a business case for this problem, thinking through those questions helps you. So this is really kind of a, we call it like the pre-filter, pre-criteria. Like you have to fulfill these um, in order to move forward and even go scope this problem. Yeah, definitely. And then to reiterate for... Um, you know, for a solved project, it might not be, you know, the, the hugest scope or this thing that's going to affect every, you know, every decision that the organization is making, but at least some connection to why is it important or why will it be informing, um, informing those outcomes and those actions that you're taking. Um, and uh, Rob, even though he presented a kind of a different framework, he's presenting this, he presented the same mental model, right? Like I want you know, X impact on Y person. So I think that's just a different way of thinking about it, but he just set us up so perfectly. Exactly. Um, and then I think, yeah, so some, some examples of these, you know, um, specific measurable goals and um, typical goals are improving or maximizing, increasing some outcome or metric. So for example, we've done a lot of projects on inspections um, so inspecting hazardous waste facilities or, um, or properties that landlords aren't keeping, keeping up to the standards that they should, so they're unsafe for renters. Um, and so one of, this is kind of a resource constraint problem in that way that you only have so many inspectors who can do so many inspections and you want to maximize the number of violations that you find with that number of inspections, right? Um, so it's sort of using... So usually um, you can frame these problems as, as um, some way of maximizing the effectiveness of your resources that you have at hand to apply them to the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and then having it connected right to an action. So what will you do differently based on the outcome of some analysis? So this is where the, it would be interesting to know thing comes in. It's like, okay, it might be interesting to know something, but how will it change what you do? Um, and this is both important um, in just the framing an effective project, um, but also because as early as possible, um, it's helpful to start thinking about who is going to do what differently, um, both on terms, in terms of like who is performing that action, um, do you have to do something to convince them or bring them along? Um, and on what time scale are they going to be do it, doing it? Because all of that will inform also the analysis and the approach. So it's sort of never too early to be thinking those things through. 
any other any other thoughts from the um, rest of the crew on on this particular point? No, I think action it, action is. I think again, I go back to the reason we push for. I mean, it's one of the things that we. You can do a project that, that, as Jane was talking about, you know, you can build a dashboard if you like, you can build a map if you want. Um, but if you are in this webinar, you've probably built those things before, and you've probably found that nothing happened. Uh, nobody did anything with it. No organization does anything. And, and so this is really making sure that the work you're doing has actual impact, and the impact is going to be through actions. Right? So for example, we had an organization come in, a large nonprofit, and said, hey, we just did a survey, and we'd like to analyze the survey, um, and, uh, and can you help us with it? I said, okay, if we analyze it, what would you do? Like, oh, we, we, we don't know. We're going to look at the results. Like, okay, if you look at the results, what are you going to do? It's like, ah, oh, we don't know. Well, then why did you do the survey? You spent a lot of money doing the survey. What was the reason for the survey? We wanted to find out what people thought. Okay, if you figured out what people thought, this was a survey around LG, uh, views on LGBTQ uh, rights. And then this, well, we wanted people to then be able to connect with different advocacy programs we're running, get them to sign petitions, to go to events. It's like, ah, so that's what you want people to do. Your goal was to understand people's opinions and their views so that you can then get them to take actions around advocacy, petitions, fundraising. And so how about we rescope this project to really focus on those actions rather than the action being analyzed data to show results, right? So you kind of have to go through that process, which sometimes takes a while, but it's, it's a useful process to understand what we can do. Right, then I, there's a question from an audience member that I think you can answer then. So the question is, okay, that sounds, you know, that sounds great, but who fills out these forms? Is it the organization with the problem or does DSSG help or how will that work within the solve framework? Because some of that requires a bit of back and forth, right? So our intention, so so far, what, you know, that, that this scoping process, and you know, we've all gone through a lot of these scoping and Andrew's doing a bunch of these now, and that's typically been our bottleneck. When we're yeah. doing projects, it takes a while because it's, it's fairly interactive, it's fairly hands-on. And one of the reasons we're, we're hoping, we're, we're reasons for launching solve was to try to scale that to, to, so an organization will come in and they'll fill out their best first attempt at this form. It's not going to be great. It's not going to be perfect. But one, having the structure means they're thinking about these questions. Um, they might not be able to answer them, but they'll, they'll at least sort of, even leaving them blank tells you, oh, maybe I should have thought about this. The idea is then um, volunteers will come in who have expertise in scoping to, to help scope that, that problem. Um, and then the senior scoping experts who've been doing it um, for a while can come in and do sort of a QA and say, hey, this scope doesn't seem right. And so just to give you an example, again, one of the things Rob mentioned in passing that sort of he didn't highlight very much, but he said the goal of their project well, were two goals. One, to reduce the number of, of these applications coming in. And second, one's to increase the quality, the good ones. If he had just started with goal number one, a very trivial way of solving it would be to make it really, 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 really hard to file an application. Uh, uh, and then you reduce them, right? Um, that's what police departments do, right? They make it really hard to complain so you don't get, get complaints, the bad ones at least. So, so that's one way of solving the problem. But the second constraint, what we, and we want to increase the number of legitimate ones, people who are, who are getting over, overtaxed. And, and, and I think that doesn't necessarily come right away, right? So that's an example where you would need somebody to come in and say, well, if it's an unconstrained, you just want to reduce this, you should just make it really hard. Um, so so, we're, so our, our goal is to kind of do these types of trainings that we're doing today and have a larger number of people be able to scope these projects so that uh, organizations coming in can both learn from them, work with them, but then are also able to do it going forward. Yeah, I mean, we I don't want to toot our own horn, but I think going through some of the ways that some of these projects and the, the different places, like the intent behind the scoping worksheet, right? Because if you're just looking at it, it can be really overwhelming. Um, and going through like, why are we asking these questions to get you to a better outcome can, I think, help make some of that process a little bit easier. 
And I think, sorry, before we move on to the next section, Jane, there's another question. Um, and I think maybe this is one for Jessica, uh, Jessica or Andrew. Uh, for scoping, are people who are like members of the team able to reach out to the partners directly? Like what does the, in the scoping process on Solve, what's the partner and kind of solver, I'm going with it, solver dynamic? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, so I think this is probably going to evolve um, as we move through move through solve. Um, but right now, um, the the volunteers and the solvers um, kind of <laughs> can put themselves into different. Yeah, you you did, you did it. It's on it's on record now. Um, <laughs> so they they fall, fall into different categories. Um, so some volunteers might be particularly focused on project scoping. Some might be uh, project managers. Some might be data scientists. Um, but for those that are project scopers, um, right now we're kind of trying out a process of, uh, of, of bringing them into the kind of like the, the DSSG model of doing this. So by showing them resources like those that we've developed and are showing today, um, and then also including them on calls. And I think the, the end goal is that at some point um, for project scopers that you know, have kind of gone through this process and learned the ropes a little bit, that they will be contacting um, the, the different organizations directly um, and, and will be having that communication. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really great answer. And there's an anecdote I read in a Atul Gawande book about how doctors learn how to put in central lines um, for like intravenous feeding. And the, 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 they have a rule of three, right? It's like watch one, do one, teach one. So you're watching one live right now. Then you just have to do one as a solver. And then you can go on and teach uh, to the next uh, kind of batch of solvers. One quick thing to add to Andrew's point is when you apply to be a volunteer, um, there is um, a box where you, you have the option to add your contact information as well. So do do that if you want to be contacted by the organization. Perfect. Uh, I don't see, uh, there's one more question that I thought it's came on the Slack, but it's a question from Savannah. And the question is, um, how are pe so the this is kind of harkening back to other other projects that were introduced during the webinar, but how are people matched to those projects? And I think I can answer that. So as a community manager and also working with Andrew and one of our other volunteers uh, who a, we went through and it was a pretty manual process for the first few, we went through and interviewed and it was kind of a first come first matched uh, approach where we talked to people, gauge their interests, their technical skills, and then tried to match it to the partner side. But as Andrew kind of mentioned, um, and Jessica also, like this will be evolving and, uh, and more like self-sustaining as the uh, platform develops. All right, is that all the questions that we have for the first section on problem description and goals and actions taken? Um, if so, we can move right along into our data section. All right, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the data section and kind of give some examples from projects that I've worked on or uh, been involved with like through DSSG. But one big question that I think a lot of people don't really address is, uh, okay, I've went through this whole process. It's like, I'd really like to do this and kind of solve this. It's like, well, do you have the data? Um, and you know, if your project can be described along the realms of scraping data, it's probably not a great project for solve. Um, it's kind of uncommon for a publicly available data source to have data at the granularity at time or level that you wanna take action on. And I think when we talk through it, like, you know, you want your actions to be measurable. You want to really impact at the level, like, you know, Rob was talking through building these like profiles of who your system or process is going to impact in this improved, you know, model based phenomenon. Um, and obviously that's not always the case. Uh, you know, we've had uh, projects where you may be able to include like weather data into predictive models, but more often than not, they're supplemental. So I remember the year that I was a DSSG fellow, there was a project with the Cincinnati fire department and there's some, uh, Maybe I may misremember, but I think there's some, some myth that like, you know, uh, when there's full moons, there's there's many more incidents. <laughs> so once they've gone through the full, you know, um, uh, modeling exercises, they put in phases of the moon as a, as a predictor just to show the firefighters they couldn't find, uh, uh, you know, an uptick in, in number of incidents on, on the full moon. So that, 
in, in other situations, you know, maybe putting in uh, weather data is really uh, important and predictive, but that's just one I remember where it wasn't. Um, yeah, and then just to add one little one little thing there is that, yeah, I think a lot of times we'll see when um, potential project partners are coming into the scoping process and, you know, we ask about what data sources do you have internally, what can you get externally, um, and there's maybe some perceived pressure of the more data, the better. And, um, and that's not always the case, especially at first. So for the fire department example, it's like once you use all of the variables that are sort of more germane to the everyday um, process and the actions that they're taking, well, then you can start to throw things in like weather data, full moons, and kind of be, you know, testing out some theories or just seeing if something else might help you predict better. Um, but that's a little bit further down the road and um, certainly usually not necessary to get started. Exactly. And then I guess one counter example that Jane noted when we were walking through this is, you know, some of the projects that have come up on solve are things like uh, geocoding data and like helping organizations do that exercise. And we really see that as, you know, something separate from scraping data because you're kind of supplementing the data uh, that you have or kind of putting it or kind of processing it in some way. And so if you're, you know, geocoding so you can understand some spatial properties, but you already have, you know, the data that you're trying to geocode that's a very different thing than you know scraping everything from the internet or uh, pulling that um yeah. yeah and i think i mean again i would go back to the actions right if your action so let's so last couple of months we've had several organizations who provide support services of different sort trying to figure out where should they should focus their their efforts so whether it's eviction relief efforts whether it's um, sending in mobile testing um, units for COVID mm -hmm. tests. And these nonprofits are small they, and, they, and they're not going to be able to collect primary data on uh, the incidence um, and the prevalence of, the, of COVID. And so there it makes perfect sense for them to say, hey, we have resources, we want to figure out where to deploy them. Can you help us scrape data from the county or the state website where they're putting in zip code level, age and, and race COVID tests and, and, in, and positive and negatives so that we can figure out where their people are being under tested and where we should focus on their efforts. So, so I think it's really starting because we're starting with the actions that then the data piece can come in you know, sometimes with publics. And, and as Harim said, it, it's rarely totally public, right? It, it's, it's, you have your internal data uh, that you figured out. Um, that's usually going to be primary, but then we can augment that as we're talking about with a lot of public sources. And those could be really good solve projects. If we've got this data, can we get this public data, link it and, and help inform actions we're taking? Exactly. And I think one point there is, uh, when you come to you know the solve platform you know more is not like ready to sing like more is not always better having a really like a high quality data set that's internal that we can help supplement on that is a really good place to start um and as Raid mentioned just make sure that does your data ac accurately reflect the outcomes that you care about and i think some of the scoping questions you see here kind of up on the screen um help do that um, one thing that I, I just put down because I thought it was pretty interesting is, is the data in a machine readable format? Um, you know, that's so high level that when you're starting to, you know, work on this, it, it, you should have a good idea. Best case scenario is that it's in a database. If it's in a bunch of disjointed Excel files, that's still good. Um, but I remember there's this one case, again, the year I was a DSSG fellow where uh, they worked with the city of Syracuse and they had... Um, these records on the quality of the pipes. So the project was predicting like which pipes were liable to burst uh, and trying to proactively inspect and repair them rather than having like a water main break. And the records describing kind of the pipe diameter, uh, length and all that, they actually were like uh, hard copies. So I remember they went to Syracuse and then the team, they spent some time transcribing that and, and putting that in so that they could put it into their model so that that, I mean, they had the rest of their data was in a database, but it was like, okay, this could be a nice supplemental and, and it did improve like, you know, their model performance. Um, so then I want to go on to talk a little bit about coverage. Jane, could you scroll up a tiny bit? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So kind of talking about coverage, uh, there's like temporal coverage and then there's also uh, coverage about um, like the individual. So kind of like how far back does it go in time? How many people does it cover? I, 
think of in those dimensions. So how frequently is, you know, is it measured? So for example, when we worked with police departments, one of the, me one of the measures we used was um, kind of just uh, the, the, the daily activity profile. So that's for each officer, you get like how many calls they responded to, what was the outcome of the calls, was an arrest made, how many people responded to the call. So that really built like this temporal profile of at the individual level. Um, and that was really helpful in identifying like, oh, you need to make a, um, an intervention at X point in time on this individual, things like that. So um, connecting it back again to the outcome and the individual uh, and the level that you want to implement. And one thing that's kind of uh, basic is maybe when submitting a project scope, if you have sampled the actual data, I think that goes a really far away so people can start to kind of visualize. Um, in this, it you know, less allow, makes you list like the different data sources and describe it. But if, you know, if, even if the data has to be fake, sometimes it's just helpful to get like a visual read on what some rows and columns could uh, look like. Um, and then one point I wanted to make was regarding the level of granularity. So, um, one thing to confirm is the data at the level of granularity at which you're going to take action. Again, tying it back to the outcome that you want to enact and the actions you want to take. Uh, I have this one example that I put in here, which was regarding, we worked with the Seattle Department of Transportation and they wanted to predict uh, which riders would be affected by a change in bus schedule and make sure that they minimize the impact on low income riders. But when we wanted to look at the, the data, the, the data was not at the individual level. It didn't categorize like who's getting on at a bus and who's getting off at a bus. So like if you had these tap cards, um, it was aggregated by the number, it was like, I think uh, the average number of people getting on a bus at a particular bus stop um, during one uh, hour or two hour time frame on a certain day averaged over several months. So instead of having, you know, this time series data, you had, okay, these are the general trends and patterns um, that occur across uh, the Seattle transportation system. So then, you know, that was the data we had and we had to rescope the project uh, because it couldn't answer the question that they were looking to answer. And so in that, you know, documenting the level of granularity would have really helped in defining uh, the scope of the, of the project there. Um, and then one thing that I learned when I was doing, going through DSSG is the importance of uh, uh, temporal cross-validation. So this is where this question kind of comes back to, how frequently is it collected or updated after it's captured? So like, do you have data far back enough to do temporal cross-validation? And this really ties back to, um, you know, if you're trying to, for example, understand um, or, or make like temporal predictions, like you make a prediction like, oh, this is what I predict is going to happen at some point. Say it's an inspection problem or a resource prioritization problem. We're going to run out of X now, then, or this person needs to be contacted here. Well, does your model, do you have enough kind of temporal pieces and chunks to train uh, your model and understand that, you know, the the example or the effect you're seeing is is actually being picked up because of real trends and patterns that are sustainable over time or due to just some weird spike in the data. And that's something I learned at DSSG. And this is something that is kind of ingrained in triage, which is the modeling toolkit that you can also kind of follow along. Um, on, and we'll talk about it, you know, uh, in the coming webinars. Um, I think that's what I have for that. If you want to yeah, go on. Let, a, I mean, one yeah, more thing yeah. just on that point is that, yeah, almost every project um, that we see uh, has that has that type of element that you're trying to be able to predict something ahead of time, right? Like that's one of the major added benefits of using data, right? To be able to, to better predict something. So that is applicable in almost every case. Um, yeah, we see very commonly that you know, you might have data a few years back, but to really be able to train a model and then be able to assess how effective it is, you need to have, you know, a training set from several years back that you then test um, on some future data, but that is some future data from that training set, but that's in the past compared to now because you already have it. <laughs> you have multiple sets of that. So that ends up being that you tend to need quite a lot of historical data to be able to start um, building and accurately um, understanding how well the models are doing. Yeah. Maybe one thing if I can add there, uh, Jane and Harim, is that this is one of the parts of the scoping sheet that 
can sometimes be hard for partners to uh, to answer by themselves because uh, without knowing exactly how the data science process looks, they they will not have uh, potentially have a clear idea of you know what the sample sizes that they need, how many years back do they need, what their data format needs to be for you or for us to be able to work with it. Um, and so this is an area where we you know not just this one but but you know in the scoping sheet we need to actively work with the organizations that might not be able to answer the questions uh, by themselves. And uh, a second point is that it, it might seem that um, you actually can start with, uh, you know, I have some data, what can I do with that to help me? Uh, it's a diff it's, it, that can lead you to, you know, complicated or interesting problems as opposed to starting with an action and saying, hey, I, I'm doing this action already. Is there any way I can leverage my data to improve my action? So uh, the order of, let's say, framing the, the project uh, should go in the right way such that you don't get caught up in trying to sort of opportunistically use some data that in the end doesn't lead to a tangible or, or, or useful action for, for the organization. Absolutely. And um, I think one thing just, I, in my opinion, here the um, best thing that a project partner could provide, even if you know, you're not as familiar with the data or um, if this is sort of, yeah, a little bit of out of your wheelhouse, um, is as Harim mentioned before, being able to give like a sample of the data, even if that has to be anonymized somehow, or you have to make up fake entries, if you can show like what are the rows and columns, um, of that coupled with some understanding of what is represented both temporally, like this goes back from 2015 to, and then all the way through today, um, and then what is kind of the scope in terms of number of individuals or number of events or um, you know, number of unique things in the data um, to say like we, this is for inspections. We do a thousand inspections a year. There are 5,000 inspections here. And that's, that represents 2,000 properties and 300 inspectors. Um, having even just those facts um, is really helpful to kind of narrow in the scope. I think uh, there's one more piece uh, about, you know, going through reliable, unique identifiers again for the external data, but I did want to touch upon one last piece, uh, which is about uh, ongoing data access. Um, mm -hmm. And this is about, you know, as you build out the solution, you want to use it kind of in production or go forward. And um, you want to make sure that whatever model solution you build, you'll be able to update over time and the data will be collected kind of in the same format or things like that. So just making sure that, you know, do you have one database for one time? Is that the only data you're ever going to get? Uh, make sure that there will be some data that you can keep learning from once you have built out some kind of solution. Um, the, yeah. One more t small yeah. um, point on that uh, is that often the frequency with which something is recorded um, or captured and then how often that gets put into whatever system keeps track of it and then how often you're able to get data out of that those are all different right so it might be that you're collecting something every day or every minute but that might not mean that you can then start putting it into your model one you know at, at a, yeah. in a real time kind of format so um, those are all sort of disparate yeah Exactly. And uh, the last piece is kind of around like the external data piece. And I think we've talked about them a little bit. The one thing I did want to kind of mention, and obviously you guys can go through uh, the scoping worksheet on your own. I think we just wanted to highlight things that we've learned from scoping, you know, so many projects and being on projects all over all the time. But I think this one piece I wanted to get kind of Raid's input on is obviously we can't, we're not going to go into like all the details about maintaining data privacy. Um, but uh, we'll also talk about this later uh, when we have a session about bias and uh, fairness audits uh, and how you can do them using some of the tools that the DSSG Foundation has put together. But it's uh, one thing that, you know, as a highlight is just don't leave out protected attributes from the data because you are worried about bias or privacy. The thing is, if you don't put something into the model, you can't query it for bias. And that's why some processes that have, you know, human decision makers that you try to replace with the model, the model may be better because at least you can query a model for bias. People get very offended if you qu query them for bias. <laughs> so having a, you know, 
Yeah, one yeah. small distinction there too is, you know, sometimes project partners might say like, oh, we don't want to include some protected attributes such as race or sex in this model because we don't want to discriminate. Um, so they might then leave it out of the data and not share it with the data scientists who are working on it. Um, and there's a, there's a distinction there too between whether you don't have access to the data and whether you include it in the model. So whether you include it in the model is one thing ent entirely, but if you don't have access to that attribute at all, then you can't test afterwards with your model yeah. outcomes. Are we discriminating against people? So even so, what regardless of whether it's included in the model, um, it might be just that doesn't. Um, necessarily mean you are or aren't discriminating against people. So the only way you can really test that is to look at your outcomes and then say, are we getting something wrong more often um, when we make a prediction about women or a prediction about black people? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think you can't answer those questions just if you don't have that information. But I think kind of around data privacy, uh, right, could you address like any differences on the solve uh, platform? Like, uh, do fellows get, or do solvers, sorry, get access to confidential data? What does that process look like? And is it up to each organization to decide? Do we have some guiding principles for them? Yeah, and I think, I mean, whatever I say is very preliminary because we're, we're yeah. still trying to figure out how do we provide this type of a platform at scale while making sure that we are protecting the privacy of the individual and the confidentiality and the, the data and all of that stuff, right? So when we do regular projects with organizations, with partners, we sign all sorts of data use agreements. We have a secure infrastructure. We, if we get any identifiable information, we first uh, de-identify it and, and in our regular analysis, we work with that data and then we'll be able to link back and give. So we go through a lot of processes. Um, on Solve, because we want a much more distributed, lighter weight um, setup. We're not kind of making that infrastructure available and forcing people to use that um, for now. And so right now what we're recommending is each organization decide what level of data to share with volunteers. Um, we recommend trying to make it de-identified uh, as much as possible. We're happy to help with that and put some guidelines in place uh, as well as tools. Um, and then we, uh, for in cases where you're sharing confidential information, the, the, the volunteers are going to sign an NDA. And again, we, you know, we want to make sure the volunteers follow through with that NDA, make sure that they don't uh, disclose any information that's, that's confidential um, and you know, follow all the, all the privacy policies. So, so right now, the, the, the plan is for organizations to work individual volunteers as we start doing more of these projects and, and grow as an organization. Our, our plan would be to provide some of that secure infrastructure for, for our partners to put their data in and for volunteers to use that platform um, as by doing the, as while they're doing the project, but we're not, we're not there yet. Okay. Thanks, Raid. Uh... Are there any questions from the audience that we should address or should we move on to the next section? We are a little short on time now, just okay. taking a peek at it. We got about 13 minutes left. So if there are no super pressing questions, it might be good to keep it moving, keep it All pushing. Right. I think it's over to you, Jane. All right. Okay, so, um, and just scrolling through here, I think that we talked about external sources of data um, and what other data you might potentially want. Um, so then, then we'll move to analysis uh, and evaluation of results um, and implementation. So as we see it's kind of coupled together. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, so the, yeah, so typical data science projects include a combination of analysis. I think that the sort of high level takeaway for project partners here is also to not be starting with analysis methods because I think as Rob alluded to and as we've talked about through this uh, this whole share, it's really about what is your goal and then the analysis method will be whatever is the simplest thing that does that the most effectively, right? So whatever method is used um, is sort of not the, not the starting point. 
um, and the yeah the analysis is not the goal so it's you know usually should be the analysis is in service of something um, and then yeah the, so so how do you know which analysis method to use uh, is how will you know how well it's working what is you know what is the way that you measure success um, and what is that current baseline so how do you know that you're doing better than the you know, status quo um, so for example we mentioned before inspection projects um, that might be that you say, okay, right now we do a thousand inspections every year and we find 150 violations or find violations in 150 of them. Um, then you might be just comparing to that, right? So if we can, um, if we can instead find violations in 300 of the inspections, then we'd be doing twice as well, right? Um, and that's not you know, that's not the only way to evaluate something. Like for example, we worked on a project um, when I was a technical mentor in Lisbon in 2018, 2017, <laughs> don't remember the year. <laughs> um, uh, um, that's 2017, okay. Yeah, well, we worked with the Dutch Ministry of Transportation on one project and um, they were looking to improve response times of officers to traffic incidents. All right, so we kind of developed a new way uh, to evaluate how well the model was performing of where officers should be placed along all these highways. Um, that was just an average reduction in response time based on zones. Um, so there can be sort of any number of um, methods of evaluation and I don't think that there should be, you know, a lot of pressure even on um, if you're an organization trying to scope a project beforehand you don't necessarily need to be able to write out a formula, right? Like with the data of how you would evaluate, but saying like how, you know, um, in just very layman's terms, like how do you know you're doing better than, or, and how do you know that you're doing something well? Um, and then I think the last kind of high level point to touch on in this section is, um, how is this going to go into implementation? So there's, quite a big leap from we built this model, we did sort of a proof of concept to say that we think we can predict something pretty well, or we think that we're doing pretty well based on these metrics on our, you know, on our initial analysis. Um, and then actually getting that to be the new way that you make decisions, right? So thinking as much as possible um, ahead about those things is really helpful. So um, both in terms of, you know, what will it take to change the system that's currently in place? Um, who is going to be kind of a roadblock? Um, who could be a partner for you? Um, and how are you going to convince people that the change should be made? So I think of one particular example um, from uh, from 20, this was 2015, um, but you know, a lot of times the the best way to convince some decision maker might be converting whatever uh, impact that you're having into something monetary. So because they have to, at the end of the day, make a decision based on a budget. So I remember we worked with one uh, with the Illinois, I think it was IDHS, um, for trying to predict which, to predict birth outcomes because there were certain, certain types of births um, that were higher risk, so that was more likely that the mother or the child would actually die in childbirth or within six months. Um, and that they called those million dollar births because they end up costing the state and taxpayers a million dollars on average. Um, so you could say if we reduce, you know, the, the number of those births by predicting which are the most risky and then um, avoiding that, then we save money overall. Um, and that can sound sort of um, callous or crass to be saying that, or, you know, we're saving money, but um, in, at the end of the day, it's, it's still, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're really still saving babies' lives, right? So it's, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, even though you're doing social good to be able to say, hey, it can also be saving money or resources. And I think, I mean, that's an, that's an example. There are several projects where we're working within within the, the, the structure that exists, right? So we often work in um, purple states where we're working with a blue county in a red state. And 
all of us involved in the project, we're doing it because it's, it's the right thing to do uh, and we care about the social impact. So in the case of, of the, of the uh, risk of adverse outcomes for, for babies, the goal is to, to reduce that risk, to, to have them grow up healthy. Um, but sometimes it's, it, the, the business case is, you know, you still have to convince the state for the business case. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the red states don't care about babies uh, um, until, you know, once they're born, they don't care about them, uh, at least. And, and so, so we've kind of often have to make sure that we have to first understand, and this is kind of jumping a little bit ahead to the ethics piece, is we want to make sure that we're doing a project that's both ethical and fair and equitable. Um, and so the, the business case, it has to first help the world. And then if the business case involves monetary uh, and financial amounts, just like the example um, that Rob was giving, right, is, is we're trying to figure out how much we underestimate or overestimate because it has a real impact on people. And so that's an important piece that, that what we go through is at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we can convince this organization to take that action. And that, that happens to be a financial business case, even though we care about the, 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 the much, much, much infinitely more about the human piece of it, um, it, it it's, it's helpful to make that case to them. Um, we've done that in many cases with criminal justice, where the, if the impact we're having is, is reducing recidivism, it's better for the world, it's better for the people who are being incarcerated. But if that reduction in, in cost that you're not going to be, be keeping people in jail, can you divert those towards mental health programs, toward other health programs, towards housing support programs? Um, and that's something that, that we, you know, we, we, we help these organizations think through. You find the police. <laughs> anyway, um, we, this might actually be a... This might actually be a good segue, um, especially given that we're running a bit low on time and have only a few minutes left, um, into also including the last section about ethics. So one thing we really wanted to emphasize is that on all, on all data science projects, and in particular on solve projects, um, even if you know, there aren't obvious you know, uh, surface level ethics concerns or that isn't obviously a central point of your project, um, we want to make sure that volunteers and all people working on projects feel very um, encouraged and empowered to bring up and raise any ethical concerns that you have um, and challenge any aspect of something that makes you feel uncomfortable or you think might be harmful. Um, and there are a number of different um, sections and I think great questions on this worksheet in particular. Um, and a couple of them we touched on a little bit you know, about discrimination and equity, like who are the people that you really think you should be protecting? How are you making sure that you're not adversely affecting them? Um, personal and identifiable information, uh, transparency, which stakeholders should know about which parts of the project. So I think we touched on this a little bit before about, you know, who's taking action, who, who's taking action, who is, do you have to get access to the data from? How are you making sure that all of those people um, have some ownership in this process so that it can actually live on and that you aren't sort of dead in the water? Um, and who are the people that are gonna be responsible for this? Um, are there any other, any things that Harim and, and Raid wanna jump in with right here? Um. I mean, nothing specific. I, I think what, what we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're, we're there's a session coming up in a, I think in a couple of um, few weeks, focusing more on the ethical issues around these projects, especially around the bias and fairness. But these are critical things. Like these are not things that you do up front and never again, uh, or at the, the end and never in the beginning. The, this conversation around ethics, privacy, accountability. Um, discrimination, equity, what does it mean, who do you care about, who's accountable, community engagement, like you want to start with those things, you want to talk to the community about, about how this project should be done, what is going to be the impact on the people, how, how are they feeling about it, and then continue to do it throughout the project. Um, and, and these are sort of deeper conversations around each of them. So we're not going to go into that detail today, but that does not mean that they're, they're not important. Um, they are equally or more important than, than the rest of the things we've talked about, right? Because this 
So, so we want to dedicate a separate session to that, several sessions actually. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, these are really important things that, that we, can't, uh, we can't mess up on because this is important. Right, I think, yeah, one thing to totally emphasize with that is you can have, um, even if you do have the best of intentions with the project that you're doing, it can still be causing harm, right? And even if you have the best of intentions um, and the thing that you're predicting um, is coupled with an intervention that is also intended to help people, um, still should, uh, you should be thinking about what could happen if this got into the wrong hands? What if someone decided to use it in a bad way? Um, and what, what is going to be the perceived um, impact of that intervention as well, as well as yeah, the I think use. That, that's a really, really, really important piece, right? And I think that the, if I told you, you know, we are predicting, if you have a project, we're going to predict who might commit crime and go preemptively arrest them, that should rightly horrify all of you. And you should all leave this webinar and never talk to us again. Um, and but if I told you the same thing, that we're going to predict who might be arrested by the police and booked into jail, but then we're going to go proactively provide them mental health services because they're, that was because of unmet mental health needs. And one of the people on the webinar was asking questions, Jin, we've been working with, with them in their county in Johnson County in Kansas on that project for the last several years. The, the core technical piece is very similar. Right? Yeah. It's predicting different stages of somebody in the criminal justice system. Um, in one case, the intervention is punitive and horrible and all the data biases lead to hurting those people. In the second case, the same data biases allow us to predict who the police might arrest correctly or incorrectly and, and, and book them into jail. And if we can prevent that, um, then that action is the thing where really the ethical piece is, can we take that action? And is that action justified and fair and ethical? And who has that information? It's not the analysis that, that brings as much ethics into play. So that's Jane's point is really, really important is the action you take on people is eventually going to be the thing that affects them. You doing analysis on your computer hopefully doesn't harm anyone if you don't take that anywhere and do something with it. And so we have to be very, that's why we've started off this full scoping thing with what are the actions you're informing because that defines everything else. So I think that's a, yeah, a good, um, uh, a good call out to some of our our future content which will be around diving into these things more deeply um, we want to hear in general just about what you all are interested in hearing about um, and we want to engage with you please reach out on slack via email um, and thanks everyone so much for coming and anything else to add from the rest of the team uh, go solvers, you know. Go solvers. <laughs> go solvers. Thanks, Ryan, for coining a new term. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> I think one thing I just want to add, right? Because I, you know, I, I work now in a more corporate culture type thing, right? So, and I work with a lot of data scientists. And even though they are technically have all the technical skills, but I think you can still learn a lot just from the DSSG framework of how to think about problems, how to think about uh, the way they may positively or negatively impact people. And uh, you, you can, even if you're not volunteering with Solve or not explicitly working with an organization that is, you know, in the public sphere, you can take this and make your modeling, I think, a bit more complete. So I think um, should always c come back, like this project scoping worksheet, I still come back to um, whenever working with a new client or anything. So I, I find all these resources still very helpful. Absolutely. All right. Great. Um, and yeah, I'll just um, say, yeah, thank you again for everybody, all the panelists and all the attendees and everything. Um, and then it's, it, there's kind of some frequent questions um, that come up and there might be some more persistent questions. Um, and I would just direct everybody to the Slack workspace. That's probably the best place to get in touch with any of us. And that's where we post most of the updates. Um, so that's the, the best way to kind of stay in the loop with all these kinds of things. And then kind of, sorry, just a bit of an admin change. I think what we'll do is make a make an event page for the webinar so that there'll be like a recurring invite or an email that'll get sent out um, uh, just so once we get all this sorted. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Right. Ciao.